Gospel of Matthew, Matthew chapter 25, Matthew in chapter 25 this evening. I'm going to direct your attention tonight to verse 13. Now in verse 13, uh, throughout the winter and spring months, uh, we were in a series here uh, on, uh, on Wednesday nights on the parables of Christ. And uh, just before we had made the summer switch, I had one more planned, one more uh, that I had been uh, working on the, uh, uh, the message, and uh, then we, we made that uh, change, and I think it's exciting. I, in fact, I want to make sure and, uh, that uh, our parents know, come on out on Wednesday nights, bring the kids. Uh, it's family night, family Bible night. We, of course, we have the kid, little kids in the nursery, and, uh, but our toddlers and our children, they're with us, and it, it's a wonderful opportunity for for children to learn and for families to be together in church. Uh, but we were working our way through Matthew chapter 24 and then Matthew chapter 25. We were looking at the Lord Jesus as he was teaching and preaching here. He was uh, exhorting and, and giving instruction on his departure, his absence, and his return. And so there was one final parable, and so I wanted to bring that to you tonight, the parable of the, the Lord and the talents, or the talents and the, uh, the servants, however you want to say it. But notice with me in verse 13, this is the last verse, Matthew 25, 13, this is the last verse of the prior parable, the parable of the ten wedding attendants, and now it rolls right in without a interruption into the final parable, the parable of the talents and the servants. Notice, he says, watch therefore. That means to pay attention. Be looking, for ye know not, uh, ne for ye know neither the day nor the hour wherein the Son of Man cometh. So Jesus is talking about himself. He says, listen, I'm going to go to heaven, and one day I'm going to come back, and there's going to be a space of time when we gone. He says, I want you to watch because I'm going to come back soon. Now, he rolls right into this parable. For, you see that transition there? Notice the transition word in verse 14. For, the kingdom of heaven. Now those are italicized. Those words are of course supplied because it doesn't really make sense going from the, he the Hebrew into the English without supplying that. Uh, to understand what, what's the context. For the kingdom of heaven is as a man traveling into far country. Who called his own servants and delivered unto them. Now notice, whose goods? His goods. All right, obviously you were not prepared for a question on a Sunday night, all right? I know you guys are ready in Sunday school, sometimes on Sunday morning, but Sunday nights, uh, I understand it could be a, a little sketchy. You're not used to the question and answer, especially on Wednesdays, you know, to be prepared. Look at that again. Uh, for the kingdom of heaven is as a man traveling to far country who called, whose servants? His own servants and delivered unto them whose goods? His goods, very important Bible truth there. Notice in verse 15, and then to one he gave five talents, and to another two, and to another one, to every man according to his several ability, or what we would say specific ability, and straightway, immediately, he took his journey. Now, let's pray. Father, we thank you for this evening. We thank you, Father, for the opportunity uh, to come to your house tonight. And Father, I pray as we look at this matter of the talents you have given us, and God, the reason you gave them to us and your expectation for giving them to us, God, I pray, dear Lord, that you would help us to understand your will for our life during this time. And Lord, I pray that you would help us, Lord, in Jesus' name, and amen. And so, as we're in this uh, final parable, it's, it's good to pause. Go back with me. Notice went back with me in chapter 24, and look at verse 44. Chapter 24 and verse 44. It says this, he says, Wherefore, be ye also ready, for in such an hour as ye think not the Son of Man of, is, uh, cometh. You see that? He's making a point of repetition here. Notice in verse 45, Who then is that faithful and wise servant, whom when his Lord hath made ruler over his household, to give them meat in due season. Blessed is that servant whom his Lord, when he cometh, shall find so doing. So we have here the parable of the faithful servants and the unfaithful servants. Jesus is talking about the same truth, the same period, the same topic in three different aspects. In this first parable, and, and starting in verse 44, he says, listen, he's the same guy, it's Jesus, and he's going to heaven. And he put us, he's given us responsibility one to another. 
in this parable of the servants, the servants were to be interacting and relating with one another. They were given that responsibility. And Jesus says, hey, you better watch because I'm going to come back and you're not going to know when. And you're really going to want to be found doing what Jesus asked you to do when he comes back. Now, let me ask you this. How many of you know that Jesus is going to come back? If you don't know that, raise your hand. All right, for the rest of you, you just found out. That's why you come to church on a Sunday night. Now, Jesus has given you and he's given me very specific things to do. You say, where do I find that, Pastor? Well, you find it in the Bible. Amen. That's why God gave you a Bible so that you could get in the Bible and find out for yours. How many of you have two eyes? Raise your hand. Two eyes. Everybody in here has two eyes, all right? Even if you have one, you're still good, all right? And how many of you have two hands? Everybody raise your two hands, all right? Very good. How many of you have a brain between your two ears? Very good. Some of the teenagers aren't sure. They're not raising their hands, but that's okay, all right? You do, teenagers, and I'm proud of you. Now, listen, God gave you two eyes to read. He gave you two hands to pick up a Bible. He gave you a brain to think on your own. Now, listen, I'm not minimizing the church or your pastor, but God expects you to walk with God. God expects you to pick up your Bible. God expects you to get with him and have a personal relationship with God. That's why he's given you a heart and a mind and a will and emotion so that you can know God. Now, your pastor's here to help. Oftentimes, as my wife and I, when, when we were in the youth ministry, I would tell our parents this. The, the youth pastor and his wife, and even, can I say, the, the pastor and his wife, we're like a supplemental, uh, a, 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 a protein supplement shake, all right? Now, a protein supplement shake or a protein supplement vitamin, listen, it's a good thing. It certainly helps and it adds to your overall nutritional balance. It helps to it, 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 uh, make your body process everything better. It can give you a little bit more strength. But listen, vitamins were never intended for you to live on. Uh, protein shakes were never intended to replace a healthy diet of greens and vegetables and protein and carbohydrates in their appropriate balance. And donuts. Let's never forget donuts, all right? Listen. You can exist on pro, but you'll never thrive. The pastor, the youth pastor, our wives, the work of the ministry, listen, we, we supplement what you're supposed to already be doing. You're supposed to be feeding yourselves spiritually. You're supposed to be growing in grace and uh, feasting on the word from going from the milk of simple obedience to the meat of stronger obedience. You're supposed to be doing that every single day. I often, uh, when we get new Christians and new believers, I say, now listen, imagine if you came to church and we had a big supper, a big lunch, and then you didn't eat all the way till next Sunday. How do you feel? How would you feel? They're like, I feel terrible. I said, would you be strong? I wouldn't be strong. Would you be growing? No, I wouldn't be growing. No, exactly. But yet somehow, folks get the idea, they, 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 they open the buffet of the Bible. On, the pastor opens the buffet of the Bible on Sunday, and we sup it all up. And then we just spiritually fast all week, and we wonder why we're not making spiritual decisions. We wonder why we're not making spiritual progress. We wonder why we're not having, experiencing spiritual victory in our life because spiritually they're starving. All right? Now, understanding all that, if Jesus gave you something to do, Jesus gave you something to do, and when he comes back, how many of you, by the signification of the upraised hand, says, I want Jesus to find me doing what he asked me to do? I believe everybody here would say, listen, I, I, I all often relate this. Uh, my sister and I were latchkey kids. My mom and dad both worked, and uh, they worked in Akron, so it was a long commute for them to get home. And usually every morning, mom would leave us a long laundry list of everything that we'd get done. We'd get home from school, and we'd have all this to do. And we knew, we knew just about, um, dad was a factory worker at a uh, tire shop. Mom was a secretary at one of the legal offices. And you could pretty much count, count on uh, it, uh, with a very tight window when the arrival time was. And me and my sister developed a very bad habit in that we knew what we had to accomplish and we had a rough idea of exactly how long it was going to take. And we would wait. We would wait till, 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 till it was red zone, all right, to where if we hustled, we ran, we could get everything done. But every once in a while, mom would come home early. Yeah. Dad would get an extra 15 minutes off and would show up early and we would be unprepared. Can I say that little feeling of uncomfortability and the accountability that came with it taught us a, a great spiritual lesson. That one day Jesus is going to come back. 
And can I just say this? I don't want to be caught unprepared. That's the parable of the, uh, the, the servants. And then the next parable we see here uh, at the very end of Matthew chapter uh, in, in, in ch- chapter 25 is the parable of the 10 virgins or the 10 wedding attendants. And this is the, uh, the truth that Jesus was giving in this parable was that each one of us is co- individually responsible for our own spiritual preparation. We won't rehash this. And then we get down into, so we have these two parables, and then the final parable. This final parable where Jesus is teaching about the end times, his return, and, and importantly, his meeting of accountability with each of his servants is the parable of the talents. Now, let's look first of all at the people of the parable. Notice with me again in verse 14. For the kingdom of heaven is as a man traveling into a far country who called his own servants and delivered unto them his goods. We know from verse 13 who this man is, this Lord, this master, this king. This is Jesus. This is Jesus helping us to understand his departure from his point of view. Jesus is, say, say, listen, I'm going to go away and I'm giving you responsibilities and I'm going to go away, but I am going to return, all right? And this is what it looks like to Jesus. Now for us, it seems like a very, very long time. Generations have lived and generations has died. And we're like, where's Jesus? My friend, Jesus will come back at the time appointed. But this is Jesus. Now the second people of the parable are the servants. Notice here in verse 14. Who called unto him his own servants and delivered unto them his good. That's the next thing we're going to look at. The second people of this parable is the servants. Now, my friends, I I, want to clarify something because some of you might be sitting back going, oh good, this is for the pastor. This is for the pastoral staff. This certainly applies to the deacons. This is probably directed to the folks in the different ministries around the church. That is not the case. You see, my friend, in the kingdom of God, can I say his subjects are also universally understood to be his servants. There is not a difference of class, of vacation of God's people. If you are a child of God, if you are a son or daughter of God by the virtue of your salvation, then my friend, because you are a son, God expects you to be a servant. Please understand, there is an equality in the kingdom of heaven. God doesn't look at me and go, oh, he's a pastor. He's more responsible and more accountable to be faithful to God. That's not true. You see, my friend, the only reason I stand here tonight behind a pulpit is simply because this is the very specific thing that God has challenged me and called me and tasked me to do. This is my job. Can I say you have a job as well? If you are a son by faith, then you are a servant by standing. God expects every child of his to be actively, purposely engaged in his service. So then that begs the question, if you are not serving, what are you? God called none of his children to be sitters. God called us all to be servants. Now, thirdly, we see here in the people of the parable, we see the master who is the Lord Jesus. We see the servants, and that's all of us. And then we see, uh, the, thirdly, the talents, the things, the, the object of this parable. He says he delivered unto them his goods. What are those goods? Notice with me in verse 15. And unto one he gave five talents, and to another two, and to another one To every man according to his several ability. God looks at them and says, look, I know what you can handle and this is what I'm going to give you to do. And then notice it says, and straightway took his journey. Now understand, when we think of a talent, we think of folks that can play the piano. All right, I admire folks that can play the piano and play the organ. Folks that are over here in our orchestra section, they they can do those wonderful things. I admire you men that God has given you the uh, skill and ability to do different things. You have talents, but that's not specifically, not not only what God is talking about here. Now, we need to uh, interpret the Bible and understand the Bible, what the Bible is saying. Now, a talent, 
all right, in the Bible is not just a skill, but it was, it was represented by a, a, a money, all right? God, the, the master here, gave to his, his servants certain amounts of money. Now, a talent happened to be the largest sum of money in the Hebrew culture, all right? When we would say, what's the biggest denominator? Go down to the bank. What's the biggest bill you can give me? They'll give you a $100 bill. They don't make $1,000 bills anymore. They don't, they don't make $5,000 bills anymore. That'd be great. You know, with the way gas is going, we're all going to have to go get $5,000 bills just to, to fill up our gas tanks. Now, um, the, here's the thing. A talent, if you're interested in biblical things, was a round disc, all right, was a round disc typically of gold or silver, all right, when it came to money. Now, it was a standardized weight. It was 75 pounds, 35.5 kilograms for you metric folks out there. But you could go to uh, the southern, southern part uh, of Israel and get a talent, and it was 75 pounds. You could go to the northern part of Israel and go to the bank and get a talent, and it was 75 pounds. So it's like if I, if I go to get a dollar, it's a dollar. If I go to get a five, no matter where I get a $5 bill, it's always a $5 bill. All right? So a talent was 75 pounds, all right, of gold. Or 75 pounds of silver. So I got online as I was studying this message this week and found out, well, what is one talent? What's 75 pounds of gold worth? Gold is currently, in current money, is $1,679,400 as when the market closed on Friday evening. All right? That's what gold was counting by. It's sold by the ounce. There are 12 ounces in a pound. Uh, then there are 75 of those in a talent. If it was a talent of silver, it's worth $19,800, all right? That's a lot of money, all right? Now listen, God has entrusted to us some great riches. Part of the truth of this parable is this. The Lord of these servants was very good. Even if the man who only received one talent... If it was a talent of gold, he was a millionaire. How many of you guys think you could scrape by on a million and a half dollars, all right? I, I think I, we, could, we, we might have to suck it up a little bit, might have to tighten the belt, do some economizing, but I think, I think we could get by on $1,679,400 at least for a little while, all right, at least for a little while. If it was uh, a, a talent of silver, it was $19,800. You know, that's, uh, that's, a pretty good, that's a pretty good economic stimulus right there, and that one doesn't have any strings attached. Now, that's what God gave to us. And so, but I wanted you to think about this. Look again with me in verse 14. And delivered unto them his goods. We understand, please understand, everything that you have, everything that I have, you know where it is and you know where it came from? It came as a gift from God. It came as a gift from God. Now I'll make the application from the biblical truth to a personal devotional application. When we think of talents, we think of those gifts and abilities. Now, my friend, the, there are two types of talents, r roughly speaking, that God bestows upon his people. The first of all are natural talents, intelligence in some, wit in another. We think of agility and speed and strength in some. We think of mechanical or musical ability in others. And God has given these, listen, as the creator, he spread these across his creation, irrespective of of spiritual standing or status. Whether the people are lost or saved, you know, they are endued by certain gifts, certain talents by their creator, some more and some less based on their ability. But can I say, there is a wonderful benefit for being in the kingdom of God. Notice with me again, verse 14, and delivered unto his own servants, uh, his own servants, and delivered unto them his goods. My friend, to those of you and those of us who belong to the Lord Jesus Christ, those who are not just a creation of God, but listen, we are a child of God by the fact of faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. You know what he's also richly bestowed upon us? Well, number one, he's given us his spirit. He's given us the wonderful abiding presence of the Holy Spirit. You know, the lost person doesn't have that wonderful, rich treasure of the abiding spirit of God. You think of the wonderful gift of the scriptures. You think that the lost man, the lost woman, as they pick this up, this is, a, this is a dark book to them. It's a closed sayings. They don't understand the truths and the, the richness and the wonderful instruction and comfort that God has given in the Scriptures. That's a wonderful gift that He's given. You think about the church. 
You think of the wonderful gift that God has given us that there's a place. Listen, a little place of heaven where we can gather together. A group of called out believers for the purpose of worshiping and serving God. Where we can experience for just a a few brief moments every week a little taste of what heaven's going to be like. What a what? What a treasure. You think of his abiding presence. You think of his peace. You think of his power. You think of the gift of access through prayer and advancement through faith, my friend. These are the peculiar treasures that are given to not the world, but to the children of God, those who are in his kingdom. Can I say to you, That even if God, in his wisdom and providence, just has issued you one 75-pound talent, you are richly furnished for his purpose. You've been richly blessed and bestowed upon by your wonderful Lord, and you are prepared, listen, you are equipped To accomplish his will. What is his will? Notice with me. Here now we get into the second part here. The plot of the parable. Those are the people of the parable. Let's look at the plot of the parable. And look at verse 16. Then he that had received the five talents. Went and traded with the same. And made them other five talents. And likewise he that had received the two. He also gained other two. What these men did is they had. Can you imagine the guy with five talents? five 75 pound discs of either gold or silver this guy i mean he he had been richly outfitted and he took that and, and and listen he got busy with it he decided now can i just can i just lay this on you now number one god is good god is very good god knows what you are capable of god knows the weight listen that you're able to bear and the guy who was responsible for uh, 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 over, five, over $7 million, he had a big responsibility. Can I say, God did not shortchange the five-talent Christian and just, just, just be chintzy and give him one. Nor did God take the one-talent Christian and put more on him than he could bear. Do you know God's a very good God? God's a very fair God. God's a very wise God. God's a very good God. But the man with five talents, let me tell you something, he rolled up his sleeves and he took one of those discs and he went out. And I don't know what he did or how he did, but the Bible says he traded with them. And and, and over the period of time, listen, he not only got another talent, earned another uh, another million dollars or $20,000, he made another. And you know what that took? You know what that required? That required he got up early and he stayed up late. He stayed faithful at the task. Listen, my friend, it took work. It took thought. It took effort. It took energy. It took care. It took passion. He said, my Lord is coming back. I want him to be pleased. I want him to be proud of me. Listen, he got busy. Now, let me just make a note here. If you go home and you're like, wow, this is an interesting truth, and you look up the word talent in the Bible, you're, you're going to find out uh, that there's this parable here in Matthew 25. And there's another parable in Luke chapter 19. Now, it's, it's the same Lord and the same servants and the same talents, but a completely different parable. And just watch. If you try to merge these two parables, you're going to be like, what? It doesn't make sense because these are two different parables. So I just want to give you that little truth there. Notice with me, so the, the servant with the five, he went out and he stayed busy and he got another five. The guy with the two, he went out and made another two. But, and then we have verse 18. But he that had received the one went and digged in the earth and hid his Lord's money. After how long a time? A long time. How long has it been since Calvary? Been about 2,000 years. Is that a long time? Been a long time. After a long time, the Lord of those servants cometh and reckoneth with them. My friend, it has been a long time since Jesus ascended on the Mount of Olives. But can I tell you, you and I have never been closer to the Lord's return ever in history. Every second Every minute, every hour, every day, every week, every month. Listen, my friend, we're getting closer and closer and closer and closer. I personally believe we're in the last of the last days. 
And Jesus is going to come any time. And listen, when he comes, what's going to happen? Notice with me, that Lord, the Lord of the servant cometh and reckoneth. That's a financial term, a reckoning. There is an accountability. There's going to be a time, my friend, you're going to stand before God. Can I just say, teenagers, thanks for going to camp. I'm proud of you. It, it takes, listen, it, for a teenager, listen, my wife and I, we had teens that they, they love camp, and they love the fun, they, love, they even love the preaching and the singing, but they wouldn't give up their cell phone for a whole week. And, and I, it, look, I, just to be honest, it's, it's a hard thing to do. You're used to having it with you, and it's a connect, connectivity tool, but I'm proud of you for going. Parents, thank you. Thank you for sending, thank you for encouraging them. By the way, pray for uh, young Joe. He's not feeling, uh, guy, he's all wore out, and then I think Michaela's not feeling well. Pray for them. Um, but listen, you're not going to hide behind mom and dad, teenager. You're, you're not going to hide behind dad and, 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 and point the finger at dad you're, or point the finger at mom. It's not going to happen. Husbands and wives, listen, you're not going to stand behind your mom or your dad or your husband and wife and say, well, that, well that, no, there's no finger pointing at the, at, 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 at the uh, judgment seat of Christ. You're not going to stand behind anybody and blame anybody because it's going to be you and Jesus giving an account, reckoning. Of how you've done with what he's given you. The Bible says this in verse 20. So he that received the five talents came and brought other five talents saying, Lord, thou deliverest unto me five talents. Behold, I have gained beside them five talents more. Look at verse 21, one of the sweetest verses in all the Bible. His Lord said unto him, well done. Those are two words you want to hear when you meet Jesus. Thou good and faithful servant, thou hast been faithful over a few things, I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. That's a very peculiar phrase right there. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. Not his joy, his Lord's joy. In fact, there's an interesting book, uh, verse in Nehemiah chapter 8 and verse 10. It says, the joy of the Lord is your strength. What does that mean? It means that when we make Jesus happy, we get happy. It means that as I look at the weight and the task and the burden laid upon uh, me and my wife and the ministry God's given us, listen, do you know what keeps you running? You know what gives you strength? You know what keeps you going forward? To say, I'm pressing on to make Jesus happy. His joy is my strength. His satisfaction is my energy. And going on, it says in Luke verse 22, and he uh, uh, also that had received the two talents came and said, Lord, thou deliverest unto me two talents. You know, I've gained another two talents beside them. And his Lord said to him, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. And for thou into the joy of thy Lord. I make a very important observation here. Can I just say this? You are running your race. And I am running my race. Please understand, in the kingdom of heaven, I'll just pick on Brother Mike. Brother Mike, you're not running against, we're not running against each other. We're not running to a, a finish line where either I'm going to beat you or you're going to beat me. That's not how it works in the kingdom of God. Listen, you're running your race. You have your responsibility and I have mine. Listen, you're running, you know who you're running against? You. You're running against your will and your flesh and your frailty. And I'm running against mine. And listen to me. It's not in the kingdom of God, listen, it's not that when I see you fail or when, or, or, or when I win, you lose, or when you win, I lose. Listen, I have the opportunity to win no matter what you do. And you have the opportunity to win no matter what I do. But you know what the wonderful thing about serving God together? I have the opportunity to encourage you so that as I win, you win. Can I say the opposite is always also true? Those who walk away, those who fail, when they fail, others fail. Now notice with me, so far it's going good. So far, listen, the guy who had uh, five talents, he got blessed and rewarded. The guy who had two talents, he wasn't in competition with the guy who had five. They weren't in competition with each other. They were responsible for themselves. But then we have this sad conclusion to the parable. We notice here in verse 24. Then he which had received the one talent. It was always responsible. Just one small thing. One talent. He said, Lord, I know thee, that thou art a hard man. And reapest where thou hast not sown. 
and gathering where thou hast not straw. By the way, that's a very unfair characterization of his Lord. His Lord was a good man, a very generous man. His Lord had no, listen, no obligation to give this man anything. And yet out of the kindness and generosity of his heart, he took his own money and at the risk of losing either a million and a half or $20,000, he entrusted it to this man. He was under no obligation to be good to this man. And yet the, ster- the servant first accuses his Lord of being unfair. And he, which had, uh, and he said in verse 25, and I was afraid. And went and hid thy talent in the earth, and lo, there thou hast, that is thine. Here you go. You gave me 75 pounds. You gave me one talent. Here's your talent back. You didn't lose anything. Oh, but he did. He did lose something. Potential. And his Lord answered and said unto him, thou wicked and slothful servant. Number one, there was a spiritual problem. And number two, there was a work problem. You think about this. What did this guy do? You think about this. These other two servants, they're out there every day. They're working hard. They're being faithful. They're getting up early. And this guy's got the thing, wrapped the the, the money in a a napkin, put it in the earth, and went back and and just sat it under some barrel and drank iced tea while everybody else was working hard. What does Jesus think about those that are sitting on the sidelines while the rest of the family of God is serving? He says, a wicked and slothful servant. He says, thou knowest that I reap where I sowed not and gather where I have not strawed. Now notice, what's the Lord's expectation? Thou oughtest therefore to have uh, put my money to the exchangers. And then at my coming I should have received mine own with usury or what we call interest. He said, why didn't you just take it and put it in the bank and let God, to, to gain a little bit of interest? There's a very important spiritual truth here. Do you know that God is looking for a return on his investment? That's true. The Lord is the, the, the master is the Lord. The servant is us. He has richly furnished us out of his goodness. And do you know what his expectation is? That there would be a return on his investment. Let me ask you this. Are you a good investment? Does the Lord realize any gains from all that he has given you? That's a provoking thought now, isn't it? The Bible says this here. Take therefore the talent from him and give it unto him which hath ten talents. For every one that hath shall be given. And he, that shall have an, and he shall have an abundance. But from him that hath not shall be taken away even that he hath. And cast ye the unprofitable servant into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. My friend, can I say... It's going to be a sad day. I think of, the, you know, the, the list of folks that we know who are popular. You think of how many folks in the recording and the music industry started in church. I mean, the list just goes on. Oh, we're not going to name any names tonight. You know who you're thinking of. I know who I'm thinking of. And instead of taking that talent and using it for the Lord, they take it and they, they hide it in the earth. They take it and and they use it for themselves. Can I just say, how disappointing. How how utterly spiritually and eternally wasteful. And so what's the point of the parable? We've seen the people of the parable. We've seen the plot of the parable. Now the point of the parable. It is very simple. Number one, the point of the parable is, is Jesus is coming back. Can I hear an amen right there? Number two, Jesus is going to evaluate our faithfulness with what he has given us. That's the point of this parable. That God has richly, generously furnished us with talents both natural and spiritual. And there will be a day where you and I will give an account. Not for our salvation. Thank God it's under the blood of Christ. But may I say to you, my friend, for our faithfulness with his goods. My friend, now listen, I'm all done. Close my Bible. You can't change yesterday. 
And as of uh, 6, uh, 57 now, you can't change today. But here's what you can change. You can change tonight. You can change tomorrow. Do you know that's the point of biblical preaching? The point of biblical preaching is to recognize where we have failed or gone astray. And not so that we can, so we, we don't live in the past. But we're informed by the past, listen, and we change our future. We change our future. Listen, tomorrow ought to be a little bit different with the knowledge that Jesus is going to come back and that we're going to give an account for him, for what he has given to us in our life. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this evening. And Father, we pray and we ask, oh God, as you have richly, abundantly furnished us Lord, out of the goodness of your treasures. Father, both naturally in gifts and talents and abilities, and Lord, spiritually, Lord, you've been so good to us. Father, I pray that tonight, all around this room, we would ask ourselves, am I a good investment for the Lord? Am I bringing Jesus a return on his investment? Will the Lord be well pleased with what I have done, with what he has given me? I pray that tonight we would search our hearts and our minds and we would examine our lives. And God, I pray we would be different and better people because of it. We ask, dear Lord, your blessing in Jesus' name. And amen. We'll stand this evening. Tonight is a time of invitation.